right, let's go ahead and get started. Hey, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on advocacy. Um, this is Charlie uh, Taylor from KDLA. I'm giving you a wave. I don't have my camera turned on, but I'm waving. <laughs> um, just a couple of housekeeping things, and I'm going to get out of the way and turn it over. Uh, please use the chat in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Um, if you aren't seeing it, there's a little purple arrow down there. You can click on that and it'll expand that panel. And then there's a little chat bubble down there and that's how you'll chat in. And I'm going to pop this link in one more time just for anybody who missed it. Um, closed captioning is available inside of Collaborate. You can also click on that link, that stream text link in the chat to view um, the captioning separate tab. And we are going to be taking questions during the webinar, so please feel free to chat those in. There's also going to be a, a bit of Q&A time at the end. And there was a PDF of the slides that was added this morning. Uh, you can just pop back into Blackboard and get that within the course room at the bottom of the screen. It says PDFs and slides. Uh, there's also a um, handout in there that's sort of an outline of things. Uh, big points to remember. So I think that's it. it I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor over to our presenters today. Please give a big welcome uh, to Dave Schroeder from Kenton County Public Library and Jean. Oh, Jean, I, I am not sure how to say your last name. Is it Ruark? It is correct. Yeah, that's it. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> it just occurred to me. I'm not sure if we've been saying it correctly this whole time or not. Uh, Jean Ruark, <laughs> Director at the Paul Sawyer Public Library. And thank you all so much for um, taking the time to do this for us, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Dave. <laughs> um, do you want me to start? Go ahead, Jean. Okay. Um, you'll notice the title of the webinar. It's not a four-letter word. Um, a lot of people, when they hear advocacy, they go cringe. Oh, my gosh, what is that? I don't want to do that. It's not what I went to school for. It's not what I signed on for. It's not part of my job. Um, I've had all those things, and I think Dave has to. Why do we have to do this? Um, in a perfect world, we wouldn't, because everybody would know how wonderful libraries are, and they would just sign on and say, yeah, we're fantastic. We're going to do everything that you want. But we don't live in that world, and it might have used to be that way, but it's not that way anymore. So we have to tell people about our libraries and what we do. So an advocacy is part of our job and is part of all of our jobs, not just directors, but staff as well. So, and the thing about advocacy is that you really are already doing it, even if you're not aware of it. So if you see on the top and the slide, it's any action that speaks in favor of, recommends, argues for a cause, supports or defends, or pleads on behalf of others. And we all know that we all do that on a daily basis in everything that we're that we're doing. So another thing I'd just like to add really quickly is um, we we tend to think as advocacy as being the the responsibility of the director. And it certainly is. And like mm -hmm. and like Jean said, we didn't sign up for this when we went to library <laughs> science school. I, you know, I went to library science school in the 1990s. It's been a long time ago. Advocacy was not an issue that was even discussed. You know, it, it was off our radars. Well, we know as, you know, the political world has changed, as, you know, people look mm -hmm. at taxes have changed, as people who have looked at, you know, public goods, and we always saw ourselves as libraries being a public good, have changed, um, that we have to do the work. And I know there are directors out there who just their personality doesn't work well with that kind of a glad handing, we call it sometimes. Um, but there's usually someone on staff who is really good at it. And so the director can, you know, still needs to be involved, still needs to be a part of it, but use your staff to the fullest of their um, abilities. You know, there's some staff out there who are just great at doing this. And it's really not you know, drawing attention to the director, it's drawing attention to the library. And so if you've got that staff member um, who can do that and do it effectively and do it wisely, because we'll talk about, you know, the wise part of this and, you know, you have to be careful about what you say and how you say it. But if you've got that person, use them. 
and you have you have staff who are involved in your communities too in different areas and they're important advocates too um, they may know some they may in contact with someone who is a decision maker and that side door back door uh, contact is just as important as the direct emails to your legislature you know um, if there's ground swell or support from other folks not just people who work at the library um, I think our legislators and decision makers pay more attention to that so it's really important to cultivate those ambassadors as well and your staff are really good at that so, so why do we need to do it? It's important. We've talked about that already. Um, if we don't tell the story, if we don't talk about it and our ambassadors don't talk about it, nobody else will. Um, our decision makers have a lot of people clamoring at them all the time and everybody wants their thing to be first and foremost. And, and it, it, you know, we all, view it that way and we all everybody from every organization comes at it in that way so the legislators and decision makers have a lot of people to pay attention to but if we're not out there with the rest of them they're not hearing what what our needs are what's important or even better how we can serve them you know what we can do to make their jobs easier because that's one of our biggest selling points is that we do have that contact in the community and we can actually help them if they let us. And remember as well, if we don't tell our story, somebody will tell our story. And so we don't want to con lose control of our message because I, I guarantee you of everybody who's on this session, there are at least one person in your county and probably many more than that who has some ax to grind with the library for some reason. It could be they didn't hire Aunt Jane or <laughs> they don't like the tax rate or they didn't like a book that was on the shelf or whatever. But if we're not telling the story, I guarantee you they're out there telling the story. So we want to make sure that the story we're telling that that we're controlling and that we're giving accurate information and that we're, you know, we're telling them what is really happening at the library because what's happening at the library is great um, at all of our libraries so we have a really great story to tell uh, we just need to make sure we're telling it and and how do we do it how do we tell our story um, the first thing we have to do is figure out who we're telling it to um, we all have different sets of decision makers. Yes, we have our legislators, but we have our members of fiscal court and we have our city commissioners. We have a lot of different people who are in, you know, involved in making decisions about our county, our, our library, our, we have our board. You know, sometimes we have boards who may not, we have board members, a few sometimes who may not be on the same page. So we have to figure out who they are. And then we have to figure out what they want, you know, what's important to them, what are their issues, what are their, their concerns. And we do that by being in contact with them, you know, however we can do that through the back door, you know, direct contact, but, you know, invite them to our library. But we have to figure out first what we can tell, who they are and what they need so that we can answer those. Totally agree. And I think it's also important. And I, I, I you know, I sent out the invoices um, a month ago or so uh, for um, our advocacy dues. And um, we have a lot of new directors across the state. And I should have done a better job of explaining what the advocacy dues go for. But basically, they pay for our lobbyists. Um, and, you know, we've had a lobbyist for a couple of decades. Um, they're doing a lot of the heavy lifting for us in Frankfurt, uh, but they need our support as well to, you know, to help them. Um, I can tell you that those lobbyists have done wonderful work for us. They have um, stopped some things that, you know, would have been detrimental to libraries. They have made some compromises for us. Um, and, and they keep 
our legislators informed about libraries in general and the struggles we're facing and the issues we're facing. Um, and so paying those advocacy dues are very important so that uh, we have that voice in Frankfurt um, all year round, but especially during the session. And, you know, with COVID last year and who knows what's going to happen this year, um, we were kind of shut out of the process in many ways. Um, the lobbyists had a little bit more contact and a little bit more connection. And so it's, it's very important. Um, if you're having pushback from your boards about that, explain why it's important and explain to them that there are many, many government agencies and many, many groups that have lobbyists. This is nothing new. This is, there's no conflict of interest here. Um, this is perfectly acceptable and it's become part of the way business is done, not only in Frankfurt, but across the country. And so please pay those advocacy dues if you already haven't, um, that, 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 our lobbyist um, is a godsend and a huge help to us throughout the year and work closely not only with the advocacy, advocacy committee, but also with, um, you know, all of our staff and um, all of the folks that we need to gain information from and to work with. So um, just, just throwing that plug out there because it's really important. It is important, and and as Dave said, you know, it's a real key feature to our reaching our legislators. But we also can prepare ourselves by figure learning more about our decision makers. Sign up for their email newsletters. Figure out, it'll, it'll be in contact with them at least that way, so that you know what message they're putting out to their constituents and you have firsthand knowledge of it instead of someone saying this so that if something comes up that you might be aware of it already because it they're letting you know that there might be an issue on the horizon and and be present you know as much as we can we don't have that in person contact as much now as we did you know, a, couple, a couple of years before covid but do be present as much as you can email them send them you know, information about your library, send them new, your newsletters, send them your updates for what's going on. And they may not look at it, but at least you are making that contact and you're keeping yourself and your library in front of them as much as we possibly can do. And this is getting back to the story. You know, what do we say? And as Dave said, it's important for us to tell our story because no one else is going to present it the same way. They're going to have a different story, a different slant. So um, we have to be the ones to tell that story. And I think, too, um, we all have kind of pivoted in the last 18 months for obvious reasons. Um, we've all found ways to serve our communities in different ways. Um, and we've all found ways to, um, I think, develop new programming during this time period that we would have never thought of before because we were kind of forced to make decisions that we just kind of kept putting off over the years. I know that's what I did. There were a few places where, you know, we have been discussing things and finally COVID made us make a decision and, and do something differently. And so there's a lot of success stories out there, um, especially during this pandemic time period, um, you know, health insurance, benefits, um, unemployment, you know, uh, the, um, the unemployment nightmare in Kentucky was horrible. Well, libraries played a key role in providing internet access and, you know, and providing some kind of assistance when we could, uh, printing materials, faxing, all of those things that helped people during this time period, um, we need to remind our communities and remind our legislators. And I think we, we often forget, we, we, we tend to focus on our legislators. Um, our legislators um, talk to the judge executives they represent. They talk to the magistrates or commissioners, depending on what county you're in. I have commissioners, some have magistrates. Um, they talk to those those people too. So, you know, being on good terms with those folks whenever we can is also very beneficial because they our legislators do listen to our county judges. Um, I mean, 
they would be foolish not to. And so, um, you know, making sure that we're meeting as many people as possible and telling those those stories about, you know, our successes in the last 18 months. This is a really good time to to pitch what the library has done and what it means to the community. So there may be some of you who are who are saying, well, my fiscal court, my chief judge executive, my legislator doesn't listen to me. And we know that they're out there. Um, so what do you do when that happens? And it's easy to just throw up your hands and say, I can't reach them, I'm not gonna try. But we can't we can't do that. So what we think is the what I think is the best way is to find someone who who can bridge the gap, someone who is a library advocate, someone who believes in what you're doing, but may have a connection with the person who doesn't align with with our with our library. So they have to be out there, whether that is someone a church member, whether it's you know member of another a club member like Kiwanis or Rotary, Rotary or some someone that believes in what the library is doing also has some kind of connection to the person who is being obstinate. Um, that can really help, and that's why cultivating those ambassadors can be a benefit in this situation. And then the other thing is that you can't give up. We have to keep trying. And I know that's easy to say, um, but we just have to keep going. And I think, too, the more we get our story out there, um, the better off we are. Because the judge executives, again, are listening to their constituents, you know, the people who vote for them. And so, as, as Jean was saying, those if you can find those advocates that can bridge the gap, that can fill in that spot that, you know, we may not be able to, to, to have that relationship with the judge for one reason or another, um, somebody in the community that supports the library can. So, you know, again, reiterating what Jean said, um, sometimes it's finding the back door in instead of the front door. Um, but you know, it's it's just a way of making sure that, you know, people understand that the library is a good use of their money. People understand that, you know, you're using your money effectively and efficiently. And people understand all the services we provide. It, it amazes me when I go out and talk to groups about the library. I still get the response. You have email, you, you have ebooks like we've had ebooks for 15 years or more you know it's like sometimes you feel like you're beating your head against the wall but you know as as library directors it's our job and as librarians in general or library staff part of our job is to let people know what we're doing and that could be in a formal presentation or it could just be when you're in line at the grocery store or when you hear people talking you know oh did you know the library had this or did you know the library had that and word does spread. So um, use all those resources you possibly can to give a positive image of the library, especially if you're struggling with your local school court or a local legislator or, or some, some person of local influence in your community. I, I spent 24 years in marketing and PR in Ohio before I came to Kentucky and the best advertising, the best advocacy is word of mouth. It's hearing someone that you know and trust recommend something. So that's why you know it's it's so much. We you can spend a lot of money on advertising, or you can wish that you could have a lot of money to spend on advertising. But word of mouth is free, and it is it really is the best. There's studies that have shown that. So if you can get people talking about your library, what you have to offer, what you're doing for the community. Um, even in those those anecdotal, you know, in the grocery in the line at the grocery or you know, pumping gas or whatever it might be, um, when you run into people that way, um, that is really the best way to get your story out there. You know, this people know more about the library from people that they know and trust 
the more it's going to stick with them, the more they're going to share it, and the more, the more successful it will be. So successful advocacy relies on relationships and goodwill. You know, when people feel good about something, they're going to share it. Um, yeah, you don't get as much sharing as for the negative things. That's that spreads a little faster, but the goodwill still is your underlying foundation. And people do feel good about libraries. Um, yeah, people. Some people have an axe to grind, but most people really believe in the library, even if they don't use it. Um, they still think the library is a good thing to have and a benefit to the community. I, I would add as well, I, I have the luxury of being in a larger system. And so I, I can get out into the public more. So, and I understand that. And I understand many of you on this, on this um, webinar don't have that luxury. Um, you're working the desk, you're taking phone calls, you're doing the day-to-day -day work of the library. And, you know, your time is, uh, you don't have the time necessarily to always go out and go to local meetings, etc. cetera. Um, but whenever you can do that, I think it's really important. Um, and I think also, you know, it doesn't have to be the director. It can be a board member. Um, it can be uh, the head of your friends. It could be, you know, a staff member who, um, you know, is really good at presenting. Um, and every county has that group or a couple of groups that kind of are the movers and shakers. And if you can get on that speaking round, even once a year, you know, just, you know, or once every couple of years where you can just come and talk about the library, um, it does make a difference because, uh, you know, many of the folks who are in those positions don't necessarily come into the library so they're not users they don't see what's going on firsthand and when you get in front of them and you start talking to them about what you're doing in the community and what you're providing in the community it does um you can you can see light bulbs going off overhead sometimes where people um you know realize that you know there's a lot going on there, a lot more than we've thought. And it isn't the library that I remember 20 years ago. It's not the library I remember five years ago. Um, and so, you know, getting out there, who, regardless of who it is, it, it could even be a patron who, you know, you really trust and value, who is um, willing to go out there and help you with that. You just need to be careful who you choose because you want to make sure that person is reliable and can give good information and has a good head on their shoulders and isn't going to say anything that's going to make things worse. But, um, it, you know, just getting out there and telling the story. We keep saying telling the story, but it's so true. And, um, you know, if you can get to those 15 or 20 people in that group, they talk to other people they talk to other people. And so the word can spread pretty quickly, which is the next slide, actually. <laughs> that was a good slide, Jean. <laughs> uh, and then, and persistence, you know? Yeah. yeah we have to keep at it. And, and another way too, I think that you can make those connections is partnering with other community groups. Um, yes. We have a ton of them in, in Canton County. I mean, I think we have a, over 100 partners on a list right now that we work with in one way, shape, or form. Now, I know in many counties, there's nowhere near that many groups. You may, you may only have three or four groups in your county. But, you know, you have the Extension Society. You have those groups that exist. You have the PTA. You have those groups, church groups, you have all of those groups that exist in every county and every place. Um, working with them is a great way of saving cost. It's a great way of saying to your community, you know, we're putting this on and we're partnering with this group because, you know, it's saving money, but it's also providing the service to the community. Um, and it's also a way of making those people in that group aware of what you're doing. Um, and I have found once you start building those partnerships and people find out what the library can do, then you have to learn how to say no because they have continued to come to you. But 
um, there's a way of, of leveraging those partnerships um, that spread your story, um, that demonstrate good fiscal responsibility, and that gain um, supporters. Um, our local extension services, like most of yours, um, love libraries. I mean, because, you know, we have a lot of things in common and they love working with us. They, they love um, when we can cooperate on different things. Um, and they talk, you know, and they may reach a, a population that the library doesn't reach. Um, and so think of those partnerships that you can make and invest a little bit of time in working with them. Um, just make sure the groups you're working with meet the mission of the library, of course, but um, those can be really invaluable. And I think that's part of the persistence that Gene is talking about. There's always a way around it. And one of those ways is to find other people in the community to support. If you're not getting it from where you need it, then find another group that will support you and we'll make those phone calls and we'll make those emails. I, and I know that that's never an easy thing to do. Sometimes it's easier than others, but it it it's hard. It's a lot of work, and it's yeah. it, it grinds you down, you know. And you are, you know, as director. If those of you who are directors watching this, you know what you have to deal with every day, um, and it's different for each one of us. But none of them are small issues, and this is just one more thing. It seems like at times, but if you can build it in to your your daily weekly approach and to find those folks who can help you do it it doesn't have to be something that you do on your own um and in finding other people is so many has so many benefits not just for you and your workload but also for the message so that is really worth the effort to to try to find those folks who can help you tell your story Okay. So uh, again, never give up. That's that's I'm beating a dead horse here. But Dave, this is the time we I thought we would talk about what's coming up, uh, what we're facing sure. with with this uh, upcoming legislative session, and um, state aid is on the radar. So it looks like there it's going to get back into the budget. Um, at least from the, the governor's the governor's initial budget, and there's a there's support for it, a lot of strong support there in the cabinet, and there is also support in the legislature, at least some support. No one has come out against it yet, and this is a good year because they do have money that they can put forward to it, and um, the funding is there. So. Um, at this point, it's a matter of keeping it in place, but, and we all know that that's not a, a given at this point, but it is, it is back on the radar again. Um, yeah, and, and one thing that you can really help us with on this, last budget cycle, this exact scenario happened. So state aid got put into the governor's budget. Um, the, 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 um, the House of Representatives, our representatives took it out. Um, so it was removed from the budget. And then usually when that happens, the Senate just rolls it, you know, rolls on with it and doesn't put it back in. So um, trying to learn from the last time, what we really need is representatives, as many as possible across the state, um, to support keeping it in. So you all can help us by either emailing um, Gene or myself and let us know if you have a legislator who you think would support this because if we can get to those specific legislators and build some momentum in the house and keep it in the, the budget in the house then we've got a really good fighting chance um, and I, I think we need to be we need to remember that state aid for for many libraries is extremely important. Um, there's libraries right now that are basically living off reserves because of state aid being cut. Um, there are some libraries that aren't buying new books or buying 
very small numbers of new materials. Um, there, uh, we're getting to crunch time. So we really, this is a good year, as Jean said, because there is some money out there through, um, you know, relief funds from the pandemic. Um, but it's also so important for, we've got about eight, 10 libraries that are really going to be hurting because the reserves are running out. So if you if you know representatives that you think would support state aid, um, it's a very small amount of money. I think it's like 2.5 million, if I'm if I'm yep. correct. That's uh, correct. In the, grand, in the grand scheme of things, it's a very small amount of money. Um, but if we can keep it in that budget and get it through the house, then the chances of getting through to the Senate are much much better. So if you know a representative that you think can help us, email Jean or myself and, and we will do our best to um, get our lobbyists to talk to them and say, this is why this is important. This is why we need this. Um, I mean, it, it's crucial to some of our libraries that are struggling and I am not sure some of them are going to be able to survive much longer if we don't, if we don't get it. Uh, and kudos to all the staff at KDLA and Terry in particular, who have been working with the cabinet to, um, for the last number of years since state aid's been removed to try to get it back on the radar. Um, they've done a wonderful job, um, KDLA um, and, and Terry in particular, in working with the cabinet and educating them on what state aid means and why it's important. Um. There's really nothing else on the radar exactly. There's There's been no talk yet about giving fee, paying fees to the PVA or to uh, the, the thing that keeps popping up is having the fiscal court appoint our board members. Um, those are not there at this point, but that doesn't mean they won't come up closer to either in session or closer to session. So we're, we're keeping an eye on those things, but, but right now there's no talk about those, but, but we know that that doesn't mean that it's not on somebody's agenda to, to try to put a bill forward to put, to put those in action. So. I, I, I've been involved with the advocacy committee, I think as a member for 15 years now, and I think almost all of that time or a good part of that time, the bill about board members has come up. Um, we seem to have found a good message about why it's important. Our board members are appointed the way they are. It's to keep them apolitical. It's to keep them out of politics. It's to make sure that we have a balanced collection and balanced program. So we've got a really good handle on the messaging for the board members one, and we've always been successful. Um, and, and, you know, I don't want to say killing that one because usually it doesn't even get out of committee. It just sits there and, and nobody takes action on it. And I think it, it is, it's put forward by a couple of legislators because they are getting some pressure back home to do something. So they put it out there and then, you know, it, it really doesn't go further than that. Um, and hopefully that'll be the case this year. But I think we do have good messaging on that. And as Jean said, the PBA issue is just, um, they've been all over the place. They're a state agency. Um, they need to be state funded. <laughs> um, their arguments um, have not really gained a whole lot of headway. I will say, um, even though they reduced the rate that they were talking about the last time they proposed this from the first rate. Um, when we started talking to our legislators about what that really meant to libraries and we used specific examples of, okay, library A, that rate means this amount of money. Our legislators, many of them were like shocked because they didn't, you know, somebody's just throwing around a percentage and they think, oh, well, 5% doesn't, you know, or whatever, doesn't mean that much. Well, it does. And, you know, it, it cuts into our staffing salaries, our book budgets, et cetera. So um, we have, we've, we found a way to, to message that as well. We're hoping the state obviously comes up with a way of funding their, the PBAs. They are a state agency and they, and they do need, 
funding. I sat through a session where Jessica Powell and I testified uh, on the library's behalf, but we also heard the, the PVAs and they do have an argument. They are underfunded. Um, the problem is the funding shouldn't come from the special purpose government entities. It shouldn't come from libraries. It shouldn't come from, you know, the fire departments. It should come from the state. It's the state agency. Um, and so we are, um, we're keeping a close eye on that and we'll keep you informed um, if anything needs to happen. But as Jean said, so far there's been nothing pre-filed, but we're still very early in the process right now. Although I did read something yesterday that somebody was already talking about um, a bill that they will be pre-filing, oh, uh, uh, pre-K, um, free pre-K across the state, which I think is a great idea. But. <laughs> Um, it'll be interesting to see what this current session looks like. And we have moved through our content pretty quickly. So um, I guess we'll open it up for questions and we'll do our best to answer. You might want to, um, Jean, what was the date we chose again? Just to remind everybody. Oh. Yeah, February 3rd. It's a, the first Thursday in February. We have kind of earmarked that day for a legislative day, depending on what the world looks like at that point. And uh, we thought we'd get it on the calendar so that we can prepare for it. And right now, even our lobbyists, uh, all the lobbyists are still somewhat um, restricted on their access and getting into the annex, et cetera. You know, a lot can happen between now and February. We're not sure which way it's going to go. Nobody is. So um, we will do something, but hopefully we'll be able to um, go back to a normal legislative day. Um, and if we do, um, you know, the more people we can get into that building and the more people that we can bring, the better. Although, Again, depending on COVID, we may be limited to not being able to bring many folks or not being able to get in at all. So right now it's all sitting there and we'll do what we got to do. Yep. Any questions from anybody? Are there any issues out there you're hearing that we need to be aware of? Um, and again, um, uh, throughout the year, directors will send me emails and, and please feel free to, to send them to Jean. Jean and I are transitioning, just uh, for those of you who don't know, I've been um, head of the advocacy committee for six or seven years, I think. I can't remember even myself. Um, Jean has very graciously decided to uh, take on the reins as chair and I'm uh, helping with the transition. Um, so please feel free to reach out to Jean, uh, and if you want to reach out to me, that's fine as well. Uh, whenever you hear things popping up around the state that you think we need to be aware of, let us know. If you're hearing about legislation, let us know. Um, that's what our lobbyists is for, too. Um, they're good at, at ferreting that information out and, and making sure that we know about things before it's too late. We have had instances where things have been passed at the last moment that we didn't know about. Um, so, you know, you guys are on the ground closest to your legislator. So let us know uh, what you're hearing. No questions, huh? Okay. Uh, I, I have a, um, a question for all of you. Um, Early on, I think it might have been under Lisa Rice, actually. Uh, I did the first one, but I think it was when Lisa was chair of the advocacy committee. We, we started what we called orientation. So the day before legislative day, everybody would come to Frankfurt who wanted to. Many of you come the night before anyway because it's, you know, traveling is an issue. Um, and we, we have our lobbyists there and the advocacy chairs and other advocacy committee members are there. And we kind of go over what the process is, what the issues are. We give you the handout. We go through the handout. 
is all of that helpful to you? Do you all want us to still continue to do that? Is that something that you find um, helpful the day before legislative day? Just put in the chat whether you find that helpful or not. Um, Shannon, I see your question about the list of the libraries. Yeah, we can come up with that. Um, although it's been our experience to that the legislators don't necessarily concern themselves with anyone that's out of, not as directly, with anyone that's out of their district. They care about bringing it home to their own county or to their own districts. And not that they don't care about the others, but it's not as an immediate concern. And I am seeing some comments here uh, about new directors. And we've had um, Carrie, um, uh, my neighbor in Boone County, uh, the director of Boone County Public Library, Carrie Herman, was at a while keeping a list of how many new directors we had during COVID. And I think she was up to 20 or something like that. I mean, we have a lot of new directors who had to learn a lot very quickly during a pandemic. Um, and so um, I think it's really important for those of you who are in neighboring counties um, to reach out and, and help them and not only with the day-to-day -day work, but also help them with the advocacy part. Um, maybe we could do a uh, bring a friend advocacy day if we can, if we can pull advocacy day off, if we can um, partner a new library director up with a, an existing librarian an existing director nearby and you all could kind of meet together and then visit your legislators together. I think that would be very helpful. It's always nice when you're first, the first time you go to legislative day, if you have somebody with you who um, knows the ropes. There is a, there is a bit of a uh, art um, to advocacy day and there's also the logistics of advocacy day that you know, once you've done it once, it's fine, but, you know, just having that help that first year. So um, if anybody wants that kind of um, assistance as a new director, or if anybody wants to help out, um, let Gene or I know, and, and we'll do our best to see if we can um, connect folks up so that when you're doing your visits, they um, you're as effective as they can be. And I'm, I'm seeing some really great suggestions in the chat about a buddy system and doing the orientation, you know, in person and uh, virtual, which I think is a good idea. So maybe yeah. we could do a preliminary virtual session also, and then do it again, you know, in person the night before for the folks who are coming or something along that line. But I yeah. think we can do both of those things. And the more comfortable you are talking, even if it is right. your first time, you've had some introduction to, you know, what you know a little bit better what to expect. Uh, I, I remember my first legislative day was just, you know, not quite two years ago. And it, it was uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, but I, I will. I had, yeah, I will say this. Um, it's really unusual for a legislator to be rude to someone who comes and visits them. I've heard it happen before with library directors or librarians, but it is, it truly is unusual. I mean, they, they'll, they'll tell you if they disagree at times, but for, for, the, for the most part, they're not confrontational meetings. They're more of, this is what I think, this is what I think kind of back and forth, um, more conversational. Um, and, you know, we provide you for for new directors we provide you with a handout it's usually a one pager so it's brief it covers the points that we're trying to cover that year that um you know we're trying to get through the legislature or stop getting through the legislature so um we do provide you with the information and the talking points but yeah i think that's a good idea gene to do maybe a um a virtual um, orientation and an actual in-person orientation um if everything goes well this coming year and christina uh, i see your question about a new directors talking to the new directors meeting yeah um i'd be happy to do it if you'd rather have dave that's fine too or we could both maybe but i'd be i'd certainly be willing to talk to the new directors about advocacy 
Yeah, I think we all remember the days of being, you know, no matter how long you've been a director, that first year, actually those first couple of years, you know, you're just trying to get everything done and making sure you're getting everything done that needs to get done. We're very fortunate, again, that KDLA staff um, really do a good job of trying to keep us in line and reminding us of upcoming deadlines, et cetera. But it can be overwhelming when you take over as a director. And so um, anything that Gene and I and the advocacy committee can do to help um, would be great. And if, like Gene said, I'd be very happy to do, um, maybe Gene and I could do it together or if Gene wants to do it on her own, that's fine. But, you know, we could certainly do one specifically for new directors, kind of a uh, an advocacy day 101 kind of for new directors. I think that that could be interesting. And again, there's so many new directors out there this year that this will be your first time where you've actually been able to hopefully go to Frankfurt. And I have to say, I'm, I'm new, fairly new. I'm just coming up on my second anniversary here at Paul Sawyer, but I'm fairly new to Kentucky, but I've been involved in advocacy for my whole career in libraries. So I, I bring that to the table, even if the process here is a little bit different than what I was accustomed to. Um, um, I still have experience, so I'm bringing that to the table. Just. Absolutely. One of the reasons why uh, the committee chose Jean uh, to be the new chair of the advocacy committee. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions out there? It's uh, Christina saying that they have a new directors meeting. Let's see, every other month, will we all be able to willing to speak at one of those meetings? Yes. Um, reach out to Jean and uh, she and I can, um, or one of us uh, can figure something out. Um, and uh, we, I think, I don't want to speak for Jean, but I think she would be willing as well to um, to attend one of your meetings um, and uh, just maybe do an informal chat about all of these advocacy issues because I know it's overwhelming sometimes. Yeah, and Dave, you can't speak for me. I, you, you're right. So. <laughs> anything else out there? Is anybody hearing anything uh, from your local... Um, Fiscal courts, legislators, magistrates, judge, county judges, et cetera, about libraries in general. Chris is making a good point. He's saying you're telling folks to highlight a thing or two of, of the good work you do in your library is doing in the community to connecting folks to jobs, information, et cetera. Absolutely. Use your social media. Um, the one thing I think that is really beneficial about being in a small community mm -hmm. is if you, if you happen to have a newspaper, which many small communities still do, um, they're looking for content. So uh, find that good writer on your staff or on your board who can, you know, um, push out that information um, that, you know, is beneficial to the library. This is what the library is doing. Let people know. People, you know, people read their local newspaper. They want to know what's going on in the community. Um, my newspaper in Northern Kentucky is basically the Cincinnati edition of the Enquirer, and it's USA Today with very little local news. And so I don't have that in, in, in my area. I know in a lot of smaller counties where the county or where the, yeah, where the, you know, the local newspaper exists, it's a wonderful resource and people still read their local newspaper. So, you know, it's a great way of getting the word out. Jessica is saying her judge has not given up on being able to directly appoint our board members with no impact from us. Um, yeah, we're, we get that every year, as Jessica knows. So um, if you're hearing that, um, try to explain to them um, why it's important that um, the process we use is, um, is used. Uh, it was begun in the 1950s or 60s. And it's worked extremely well, and it's kept our boards nonpartisan. 
It's made sure that we have library supporters on the board and it's worked. You know, libraries haven't had, you know, financial, you know, crises. We haven't had, you know, uh, it's very rare when libraries have done something that they shouldn't be doing. I mean, we're very conscientious people. Um, and so, you know, the system has worked really well. We just need to keep reminding them that, you know, we understand, but the way it's set up was set up for a reason. It was set up to make sure that libraries are independent that they are serving everybody in the community and that are not being pulled into partisan politics. Jessica, do you have any idea what his, <clears throat> what your judge's hot button is, why this is such a, a passion for him? What, what's, what's pushing him and continues, or do you know what's pushing him and continues to push him in that direction? Um, if you can, come at it that way and maybe either diffuse it by having someone else speak with him or so it's just party huh hmm. i don't That's know awesome. never come. <laughs> yeah yeah thought if it was some personal thing then maybe we'd have a, a way to go but Yeah, and I think you're, you're, uh, Liz is making a good point. You know, we just got to keep hammering away and telling people about, you know, what we do and how we do it and why we do it and why it's important. I do, I apologize. Um, a, a friend of our family passed away and I've been asked to um, lecture at the funeral. So I need to, to dash off. I will leave you in Jean's capable hands. And if I can help in any way, please reach out to me. Um, I'm, I'm happy to help and I'm happy to pass things along to Jean. <laughs> I'm smiling, Jean. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm, even though I'm leaving as chair of the advocacy committee, I'm not leaving the advocacy committee. So um, anytime I can help, please reach out. Sorry, again, I apologize for having to leave. It's a bit rude, but I really feel I need to be at this funeral. So um, I will uh, hopefully see you all soon and uh, have a good fall. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Dave. Um, Liz, I wanted to talk to you about your, you know, your comment about not being able to spew numbers and things. That's not necessary. Um, if you have a few things, like a couple of amounts that are, that are, some details, some numbers, even one or two things that you can say, attach a number to, that would be great. But if you can't remember that, and I have trouble with that myself, um, don't do it. Don't worry about that. But, you know, use what you're, say what you're comfortable saying, you know, about the great things that the library is doing. Um, it, numbers are good, but they're not the be all and end all. So it's, it's more the intent of what you're saying, I think, that comes across without having to memorize percentages and dollar amounts. Yeah, Chris, you're right. Stories are even more helpful. If you can give an anecdote about someone who was was helped, you know, someone who found a job or, you know, made a connection with someone else in some way, some, some way that the library provided something for them to better their quality of life. Those stories are fantastic. Yes, it's, it's touching the human parts of us. That's where we relate. And, and that's what laborers are so good at doing. And sometimes we, we just take that for granted that we're not, you know, this is just what libraries do. And it can be hard to look at that as a story to tell someone else, but it really is, it is the story of the library, so. Any other questions?
Okay, Charlie, I'm going to toss this back to you. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much, Jean. And I want to say I'm just going to move through a couple of final slides here. So if anybody has any other um, final comments or questions, you have another minute or so to do that. <laughs> um, we thank uh, the Institute of Museum and Library Services for their sponsorship of this webinar and um, our, well, our services at KDLA. <laughs> also encourage you to follow us on social media on Twitter and Facebook. And uh, we have some, the links on the inside the webinar are not live, but if you download the PDF from inside of Blackboard Learn, all those links will be live. So including Jean and Dave's emails, as well as these links to um, some KDLA pages. And we hope this was helpful for you. I hope it was a good introduction. You've gotten some ideas and um, I know Jean and Dave will be more than happy to talk with you. Um, sounds like even help out with some meetings. So I really want to extend big thanks to Eugene um, and Dave. I know he's headed out. Uh, I'll do it electronically. But thank you so much for sharing your time. I know you are, uh, a, a, the directors here all know how busy you are. And those of us looking in from the outside also know. So I know it was a, a big commitment for you. Thank you so much. And um, Oh, a couple of other things um, before I let you all go. Uh, this was recorded and will be available uh, hopefully within the next week to for you to share with your staff, with your trustees, anyone that you think would be um, helped by viewing the recording, you'll be able to do that. And also I'll be emailing out a survey uh, about this webinar. If you share with us what you thought, um, other things that you'd like training on, and also what you thought about our new um, system for presenting webinars, we appreciate any feedback on that as well. And uh, for those of you who attended live, you'll be able to get a certificate of attendance today inside of your um, dashboard, your learner dashboard there. So thanks again. And Jean, is there anything else you'd like to add before we say goodbye? I uh, just want to reiterate that you can contact me or Dave or both of us anytime and we will do everything that we can to answer questions help you out um, and to help it let be less intimidating for you awesome thanks everybody and uh, have, have a great week and we'll see you later thanks again Jean you're welcome thank you bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.